we're going into the section where we're going to have a discussion about the key, the key findings of the reports. And I think that it is important just to reflect on the uh, message that was shared uh, during the opening remarks, uh, particularly uh, referencing the percentage growth that we are proud of as a continent in terms of the fact that uh, quite a number of the uh, top growing economies in the world come from here, but also the realism that was um, put on that percentage growth, just given the fact that people don't eat percentages. Uh, percentages don't fund their uh, living, and uh, percentages uh, certainly don't shield them from some of the adverse effects of, of climate change, for instance. So, so the message and the question uh, that I hope that we'll be able to better address right now is how to translate the uh, percentage growth um, of Africa and uh, Professor Arama, you uh, mentioned uh, the need for the continent to grow by a uh, seven percent uh, consistently for four decades to achieve some of its goals. Even with that, how to ensure that when we do get there, it is done in such a way that is sustainable, such that a lot more people do have uh, food on their plates, a lot more people have got more money uh, in their pockets, and as I said. A lot of us, are, a lot more of us are insulated from some of the risks, the broader risks that are uh, keeping a lot of people down in terms of uh, poverty and inequality. So first of all, I'd just like the uh, speakers, other than Professor Orama, just to reflect on some of the key findings of the report as they do pertain to the state of the African economy uh, right now. And Professor Sachs, perhaps just to kick it off with you, sir. It shows a mixed picture uh, Africa is achieving uh, moderate economic growth, but there is a considerable amount of financial fragility. This is the, the main picture. And we want to move from this situation to a situation of uh, much higher growth, which is absolutely feasible, and uh, lower financial fragility. Those go together because in fact, to get to 7% or even higher growth per year will require long-term, low-cost finance at the center of the strategy. And what uh, one of the very telltale graphs shows is Africa is paying a punishing risk premium on its finance, and it cannot achieve rapid growth if it is paying a risk premium of 750 or 1,000 or even higher basis points uh, on uh, its debt. So to my mind, the core messages are that Africa is in a situation, is in a circumstance in which it can achieve this goal of sustained, very rapid growth, but it requires a financial, fiscal, and transformation strategy to do so. And many of the elements of that have been laid out. I want to underscore a few points quickly. First, long-term development cannot be based on short-term loans. This is the most important point. Loans for Africa should be at least 25 years or longer. This is a central role for the African Development Bank, but it also means that the euro bond market is a trap. Because if it's seven-year bonds, there will be liquidity crises inevitable when rollovers are needed. We need a financing strategy based on long-term development and long-term borrowing. The maturity structure is fundamental because African countries, sovereigns, borrow in foreign currencies to a significant extent. That will remain true for years to come. That means that there's always liquidity risk, and that means that short-term borrowing is dangerous for long-term development. Just to say, I won't go on too long, I know we have a, such a wise panel, but to say 7% per year growth means a doubling every 10 years. If you do that four times, Africa's economy will be 16 times larger than it is today. What looks like a lot of debt today won't be 
very large in the future. Africa can bear a lot more debt, in fact, because of rapid growth prospects. But if the debt is seven years or 10 years and the growth requires 30 to 40 years, there will inevitably be the kinds of fragility that we have right now. This comes to the question of strategy and global financial architecture. We need much, a much larger African Development Bank. We need much larger long-term funding when there are partners like the Belt and Road Initiative in China, which I'm a great fan of, the lending should be at least a quarter century. And this is a point that the AU can make in the G20 context to the partners, which is we have the highest growth prospects in the world. This is no doubt true. Africa can grow faster than any other part of the world. It has more headroom, more catching up space. It can achieve absolutely 7 to 10 percent per year growth, sustained for four decades. But it requires the financing and the partnership to do it. What else does it require? It requires the following, a very strong integration at the AU scale. Africa is the same size population as China and as India. Those are each one country. Africa is 55 countries. Africa has to act, though, like one economy. This is extremely important because that scale will be the breakthrough. That's to the advantage of every single one of the 55 countries joined together. Second, that means cross-border infrastructure for power, for fiber, for transport is absolutely essential. This is a great continent, and it needs a great continental infrastructure. This is absolutely key. And the third point that I would emphasize, because I would love to uh, have the chance with these esteemed uh, colleagues to discuss for hours, but the third point that I would emphasize is get every African child in school for a good education, at least through upper secondary. Right now, the completion rate of upper secondary is only around 30%. It needs to be 100%. That's a, basically a financial barrier, by the way. I think every leader here wants universal education but can't afford it. And this is why finance is so essential. But don't finance education with a 10 year loan, the kids will still be in 10th grade. <laughs> Finance education with a 40-year loan to give them the chance to graduate, join the workforce, be the skilled workers of the future, and 40 years from now it will be easy to repay. Education has an internal rate of return of at least 20 percent per annum. But it takes a long time. You can't hurry it. It's one grade at a time. So long-term finance, get every child in school, give them the fiber, give them the uh, digital, give them the basic infrastructure. Africa will be the world's booming, fast-growing region of the world for decades. So this is to move from where we are today, some reasonable performance but fragility, to the best performance with financial robustness. I think that's the objective. Thank you. Uh, and Prof, uh, a really interesting uh, comment that you do make in reference to the euro bond market being a trap. Um, just given the, uh, I think, the resumption of uh, players entering that bond market that we have seen in the recent while. Uh, particularly since the advent of the pandemic. But I want to pick up on a point that you made around scale and uh, Africa acting uh, more as one. And uh, Ambassador Muchanga, I want to pick it up uh, with you. Just as you obviously uh, reflect on the uh, macroeconomic performance outlook, but uh, we do know that one of the uh, ways that the continent is trying to scale up and uh, act 
more as one is through the uh, Africa uh, Continental Free Trade Area deal. Uh, much has been said about what has been done on the ground so far, uh, what hasn't been done on the ground so far. Perhaps uh, your reflections then on the state of trade dynamics and the uh, potential uh, that, of course, it does have in helping us realize the better growth that we all want to see. Thank you very much. I think uh, before I go to the issue of uh, uh, continental economic integration, actually it was my number one point uh, in my notes. Uh, let me congratulate <coughs> the African Development Bank Group for this publication. Uh, it's the second one. Very, very, very well researched, very informative, and it's going to be very useful to the policymakers, and like we indicated, the researchers. And uh, certainly, if, uh, I would encourage you to ensure that uh, when the heads of state and government uh, are meeting tomorrow, if they can be aware of putting the document on, the, on their tables. I know there's going to be complaint about language, but at least uh, if uh, they can get the information, that would be very, very, very useful. Uh, Professor Sachs raised a fundamental issue, <coughs> and that's the continental integration. Uh, I always say that uh, the long-term future of Africa lies uh, in the accelerated and deeper uh, economic integration. Because uh, the small economies, the small economies that we have really do not make us very, very competitive in uh, the global markets. And the situation is getting worse now. Because uh, if uh, any one of us wants to export, for example, if you want to export it to, uh, to Europe, you are going to uh, face the cross-border adjustment mechanism. That's uh, another barrier to, uh, to you really exporting. So if you have an internal market, it's much, much, much easier. And uh, when uh, that market is also uh, functioning very, very well, it can uh, promote uh, productive transformation by ensuring that uh, uh, there is value addition and uh, there is intra-African trade in manufactured goods, and key also uh, intra-African trade in the intermediate goods. Because when you look at the structure of manufacturing in Africa, the highest cost element is uh, on the importation of inputs going into manufacturing. Uh, we really do not uh, come up with intermediate goods which you can uh, use to add value within the domestic market and uh, trade across the, bo the border. So that's one issue where every year we should be emphasizing that uh, we need to deepen the process of uh, economic integration. Now, the other number that uh, I'm very much interested in, the growth rate uh, is uh, very, very important. But uh, the GNI per capita of uh, Africa, I think we need to be looking at uh, that number. Uh, where are we right now? I'm raising this issue because uh, uh, a few days ago, I was uh, uh, reading a, a one uh, report, and uh, it indicated that uh, uh, <coughs> since 2014, GNI per capita in Africa has been declining by about 10%. I don't know how far true that is. So I think in future editions, let's try to capture that number. It's quite, 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 quite useful. Uh, when we go to the G20, uh, a number of issues are going to be uh, high on our agenda. And uh, one of the issues is very sensitive, but uh, we would like to collaborate with the African Development Bank Group and other knowledge partners. And this is the issue of international taxation. Uh, the African group, uh, led by Nigeria, uh, were able to win a decision that uh, we should start uh, discussing the question of a framework convention on international tax cooperation, which is inclusive. Uh, when the vote uh, came out, uh, virtually all the OECD countries voted against us, uh, except uh, Norway. And uh, their position is that uh, they already have the G20 uh, uh, OECD inclusive uh, framework on the uh, base erosion and the uh, profit uh, shifting. So in their view, that is enough. So what we need is really to see if we can establish dialogue 
between ourselves as Africa or the global south and the, the, uh, the OECD to see if we, we can, there can be a meeting of minds on the efforts that we are making in that area. Uh, the issue of debt restructuring is very, very, very important. Uh, a few days ago, I was uh, in discussion with one of uh, uh, the State Department at the US, he used to be Assistant Secretary at the Treasury, indicated that uh, we will come the Commonwealth framework on debt restructuring, but it's very, very slow. And uh, I think uh, there's a misunderstanding within uh, the official creditors and between the official creditors and the private creditors. Uh, each one of them think uh, they are giving more than uh, the other. Mm, so they cannot uh, really compare uh, how uh, they are making, I mean, they, are, they are contributing to the debt restructuring effort. So it's one of the urgent issues that we need to bring to the G20 to say, how can we facilitate faster debt restructuring? And uh, I think as emphasized uh, in your report, uh, a lot of our countries are facing debt uh, distress situations. Uh, the president of the African uh, Development Group raised an important issue of um, uh, natural resource governance. Uh, as we are going to the COP28, I think uh, there are a number of stories uh, about uh, African countries uh, having uh, uh, carbon trading deals uh, with the other countries around the world. And the numbers that were coming out uh, were very disheartening. It's really, we are underpricing our assets. So, again, the African Development Bank, I think we need to work with the countries to ensure that uh, we have common guide, uh, guidelines so that uh, when uh, our countries go, our governments go to really engage in carbon trading, I think uh, we do not undersell our assets. And uh, other than uh, the guidelines, also I think uh, that the issue of uh, accounting for the forestry that we have, um, indicated, yeah, we indicated that uh, we are working on that one, which is very, very good. And also training the negotiators uh, on how to come up with uh, very good deals. But right now, I think we are underselling ourselves. So on the whole, it's a very, very good report, and uh, we encourage you to continue publishing it and distribute it as much as you can. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Suffice to say that if I come to you, uh, Prof. Uh, Shimilis, for your uh, reflections, uh, we've heard quite a lot uh, that has been said so far about the number of uh, countries on the continent that are in uh, debt distress. <laughs> Okay, perfect, that are in uh, debt distress at this present moment in time. We know that uh, the risks of uh, defaults are high and there's been, there has been a few casualties in the recent past. Your reflections, uh, sir, on uh, the uh, topic of hand today and maybe even interventions on uh, the issue around debt distress right now and uh, defaults on the continent. Let me also um, express my uh, appreciation to the African Development Bank uh, for inviting me to this wonderful event. Um, and good to be in the company of friends. Um, I have been uh, in this business also with them for a long time. So uh, the African Economic Outlook, as uh, most of you know, has brought out the African uh, voice in a very, very uh, telling way. So I would like to thank uh, Professor Kevin Rama, who is the chief economist, uh, leading this pack. Um, and the preparation that it takes to come to this point is extremely, extremely laborious and, and requires a lot of expertise, uh, care, uh, particularly to inform, influence, and inspire African decision makers and tell their story as it is. Now that's what we heard today, the resilience of African economies. We don't talk much about it. But most importantly, in the light of this major unprecedented and rapidly evolving global shocks, Africa is still there maintaining a steady economic growth even macroeconomic stability is not as bad as 
it would have been uh, given uh, the kind of economic management we used to have a few decades back. So we are holding uh, very well. Actually, the 18% inflation rate, if you take out a few extremely uh, in high inflation uh, situation, countries like Ethiopia, for instance, and others, the average inflation rate in Africa is low. Now, when it comes to the uh, debt issue which you mentioned, uh, I think um, uh, already it has been uh, uh, mentioned in the report, but also uh, distinguished panelists and the president of the African Development Bank uh, said that um, Africa is not a bankrupt economy. It's not uh, a continent that should have been suffering from liquidity challenges that we see today. But also some of the challenges I would like to apportion it to two um, causes. One is, of course, our own economic management. Um, uh, the other is the global financial system itself, uh, the way it's built and the way it functions doesn't serve the interests of Africa. This is well, well noted. I think as the commissioner uh, indicated, there are a lot of gaps and holes in, in, uh, in how to deal with the debt uh, situation we are in today. So let me just mention first, what does it mean even a country is in debt distress? You know, there are different ways of looking at it. If you look at Ethiopia, for instance, um, the debt to GDP ratio is uh, much, much lower than anywhere else. But the cost of borrowing, and of course, the returns to the debt investment that we have made has not been aligned, unfortunately. So it has put us in a liquidity crunch. However, the country can revive and even be able to carry a large amount of debt to finance its investment needs. Ethiopia has been growing for instance, over 10 percent for uh, over a decade with an investment to GDP ratio of 40 percent and unseen in many African countries, a saving rate that shoot up from merely 5 percent to 22 percent in 2019. So, so, you know, the country could transform itself uh, within a short space of time, for instance, as the president of uh, the bank mentioned, had the global financing mechanisms been favorable, like uh, the interest rate 9% charging uh, poor countries, what is the point? By credit agencies, uh, the ratings are based on, not on needs, on vulnerabilities, but rather more ability to pay, which is defined from their prism. So, uh, so, so I think uh, African voice have reached to a point where global financial architecture has to be significantly overhauled. It has to be inclusive, it has to be just, and it has to be also uh, gives room for uh, what we call global safety nets uh, during liquidity challenges. Uh, so, so I think uh, what we are seeing uh, debt distress today is artificially created by a system uh, where uh, uh, the African uh, potentials are not captured uh, well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, a system... <laughs> Uh, a system that uh, has been historically unfair, uh, in a sense. But I like what you did mention, sir, about the fact that uh, some of the uh, challenges that we are experiencing as a continent is as a result of uh, some of our own mismanagement. I mean, I just reflect on the country that I come from, South Africa, and we're talking about domestic resource mobilization and uh, the liquidity of capital markets. We've got the largest on the continent, and we've got an active participation of investors in it. But we also pay a very high price for for uh, that debt, just as a result of unfairness in ratings, of course, but a lot of it being as a result of mismanagement when we do look at how uh, economic affairs have been uh, managed, when you also look at uh, what is happening regarding the uh, infrastructure around our electricity and our ports. With that said, I'd like to see if uh, we can get a Professor um, Minister of Finance, of course, um, Tuli Ngubi back uh, with us. Thanks very much. Uh, just to congratulate the African Development Bank for the report, uh, it is really on point. 
And I think they raise very pertinent issues about Africa's growth our pro prospects for 2024. And also I appreciate the contributions from Professor Sachs and, 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 and Commissioner and uh, Professor uh, uh, Bebe Schmelis, uh, uh, very important points that they raise indeed. Just looking at the growth pattern, uh, I really agree that my region, which is Southern Africa, is, is really projected to grow the slowest. I want to highlight a factor here, which is that of climate change, that, for example, in Zimbabwe, we expect growth to slow down. Last year, we had a growth rate of 5.3%. In 2024, we expect a growth rate of 3.5%, likely due to climate shocks. So really, um, we expect a lower rainfall pattern is already showing. And uh, you know, as they say that in our part of the world, a minister of finance is also a minister of agriculture. So I worry whether the rains are good or not. And it means I have to start worrying about uh, you know, uh, grain imports and, and that, that's, that's real. Um, so, so really it means we have to invest more in climate proofing our agriculture if we want to, I think, uh, achieve sustainable economic growth. So, so, so climate proofing agriculture is a very critical issue in, 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 in you know, ensuring sustained uh, economic growth going forward. Then let me raise another issue regarding debt. Again, the, the, the debt situation is rather elevated. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we're aware a few countries uh, you know, trying to restructure their debts, including ourselves. Uh, they will, for example, we've got the G20 common framework, uh, and I believe that uh, well, it was Zambia, Ghana, uh, Ethiopia, Chad uh, are on that uh, you know uh, program, and, and and Zimbabwe is has got a different program. We've started our own um, engagement with creditors to try to restructure uh, our, our debt and get some debt relief. It's really holding back economic growth uh, if, we, if, we, if we don't deal with it and, and we're determined that uh, uh, this be, 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 be sorted, sorted out. So that, that process is, is continuing. Uh, it means that we would have to then focus on specific reforms, economic reforms, uh, governance reforms, and also reforms around property rights uh, for the agricultural uh, sector. So we're working very well with all our, our, our creditors and we hope that over the next year or two the issue of debt in Zimbabwe will be resolved. But let me highlight something else. And you know, the, the if you look at global interest rates, this has been mentioned in the report and, and by other uh, panelists, interest rates have really shot up, and this is an issue. And uh, including SDRs, I don't know if the colleagues are aware that when we received the SDRs from the IMF, the interest rate rates were like 0.2% or something. And now the interest rates of SDRs is more like 4.5%. So even resources that we thought were concessionary are no longer concessionary. And this really speaks to the, the changing uh, credit situation uh, globally, where interest rates have gone up and we're feeling the pain of, of the debt service uh, 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 costs. And, and the issue was raised uh, by President Adeshina on this natural resource uh, governance issues. Uh, uh, Ambassador Zimbabwe takes this very, very seriously. And in the case of the lithium sector, we've actually, uh, you know, uh, passed a, a law that really no exporter should export raw lithium, for example. Uh, everything should be beneficiated up to the level of lithium uh, sulfate, because that way you can increase the price easily ten times by just insisting on beneficiation. This will improve our our export uh, our states. So, so really, as part of that natural government, government is insisting on beneficiation. And I think that, that that's the right thing uh, to do. The other issue that we are we're, we're really uh, insisting on is, is that it's really the removal of all tax, you know, um, uh, uh, incentives for the mining sector. Uh, in the sense that uh, we, why, why, why you know give these tax incentives? The mining sector they know how to give themselves tax incentives through all manner of, uh, of structures that they can put in place with the help of the accountants. So so why should governments do that? But really, we should be insisting on beneficiation. Uh, if they beneficiate, that's why we should be giving tax incentives at the beneficiation stage in terms of the of the value chain for these um, uh, for these uh, minerals. I thought that those are the things really that we should be highlighting. Now, coming to the to the to the uh, uh, you know uh, thing, we are grappling with inflation here on the domestic front. front. Uh, I think we'll, we'll deal with it uh, uh, successfully. Uh, we have tight monetary policy. Uh, and so, so it is partly the reason why growth will be slightly slower because of the tightness of liquidity. But it's necessary uh, for us to deal with inflation uh, and for us to be able to live uh, within our, our means. I must say that 
on, on the fiscal front in Zimbabwe, we've, we've done well over the last five years uh, and run a deficits that are no more than one and a half percent of GDP. Uh, they've all averaged one and a half percent of GDP. We've done very well, but it's, but it's because we have by running a, 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 a quasi cash budgeting system and making sure that we don't live above our means. And then on the current account, um, uh, I noticed that the report does say we, you know, that will come under some squeeze. That is true, even for us. We have had a current account uh, surplus for the last five years, uh, but this year, 2024, will be the smallest uh, surplus. We are now down about 80 million US dollars from as high as uh, four, uh, 400 million US dollars five years ago. So, so really, the, the what's in the report and what we're experiencing in Zimbabwe is very consistent, and I congratulate. Uh, 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 you know, the, the ADB for, for this uh, uh, report. And let me stop here for now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And uh, of course, thanks also to uh, Prof. Uh, Sachs, who uh, has to uh, step out at this present moment in time. And what I wanted to ask you is the situation around the hard landing and how much of a viability it is for uh, certain parts of the continent. Uh, you have made mention of the fact that inflation uh, continues to shoot in the wrong direction in many parts of Africa. And what we have seen is a continued aggressive intervention from central bankers. Let me not call it aggressive because really they're trying to do all that they can do to bring this inflation down. But the question is at what cost and whether this inflation is what actually takes a few economies into um, into real recession or into a real hard landing on the uh, African continent. Your, your uh, interventions on that, sir, and how much of a viability a hard landing is for Africa and which parts of Africa right now? Before going into that, let me really, really appreciate uh, the inputs and comments that have been made by the panelists, some of them traveling far and be, uh, beyond to be here, Professor Jeffrey Sachs and, and uh, his beautiful wife, Sonia Sachs, traveled all the way from the US to be here. We really, really appreciate that. And uh, <coughs> uh, Commissioner Muchanga, my brother, Abebe Shimeles, and President Adesina yourself, really, really appreciate you. And all those who are connected online, I know we have hundreds of you, uh, if not thousands, connected, and those who are really here. Uh, <coughs> The point you raise is one that is really sometimes touchy to discuss. Uh, managing inflationary pressures often comes with, you call it hard landing, but maybe austerity measures also for countries. Because we, that's why I hinted that in my presentation, we've seen um, the, the fiscal consolidation that happened in the United States, in the Eurozone in the past two years. It was tough for citizens. Energy prices went up, food prices went up. Many things really had s significant issues there. But the difference is that then there is also fiscal policy measures that are put in place to cushion that impact on the most vulnerable. Ensuring that while interest rates are, go are going up, it doesn't crowd out um, small and medium term, um, uh, medium uh, term um, scale enterprises, and it doesn't also impact on the vulnerable households significantly. And many African countries are doing that in terms of providing, um, <coughs> you know, measures to cushion those impacts on countries. But the only thing I would say is that it's like pulling teeth. When you have a bad tooth, going to the dentist is often scary. Uh, because it's painful, but when the put tooth is pulled out, you feel better later. So that short time, a uh, short term, had or uh, impacts of monetary and fiscal policies to address these challenges that we're having should not be a disincentive for not pulling out that tooth. Mm -hmm. Because if you leave the tooth, maybe it will affect more and more tooth, and then you have more problems um, going forward. So what I have seen in many African countries is actually a stellar job being done by central banks to try and manage inflation, actually using tools that in the, in the continent is not as effective as it should be because of several structural factors in the economy 
that we, we have discussed in the report. But then uh, we're seeing a lot of dividends in terms of like in, Af in the, the Western Africa region, the Nigerian government has been implementing a lot of policies, tough for citizens, but we're seeing projections of growth rebounding in 2024, 2025 because of those policies. So my encouragement to citizens and policymakers is to ensure that we have a measured approach and a balanced approach between monetary and fiscal policy to ensure that it doesn't create hard landing too much for citizens. Okay. I think that everything that has been or that is uh, that was required to be said has been said. But any parting shots from the uh, panel before I hand over to you, uh, Professor Rama, for the official close? My parting shot is that um, we've got very good partnership with the, the African Development Bank and uh, certainly when the, we move together, we are stronger. So as African Union Commission, we'll always be on hand whenever we have to move together to say, let's move together. And uh, uh, as we go into the G20, the African Development Bank is going to be uh, one of our knowledge partners. So the, the information that is coming out is going to be translated into policy proposals when we are making proposals at the level of the G20. So the work you are doing is very, very useful. Mm -hmm. And once again, congratulations. No, I think it's been a wonderful uh, discussion. Um, just to uh, follow up uh, on the inflation, mm. uh, hard landing uh, you mentioned. Um, just, to, uh, uh, I was in Nairobi last year, living there throughout the COVID time, and nothing of uh, the sort happened until the war in Ukraine mm. triggered a significant hike in the prices. Even you know when the government was pouring money during the COVID time, reduced uh, sub um, increased subsidies, reduced taxes, and spent a lot on social protection, things were okay. And then the war in Ukraine, uh, for various reasons, we don't need to go into it. Prices, inflation started to uh, rise, not only in Kenya but in many many African countries. So this is beyond their control. One is that, that fact. The other is the uh, shock therapy that uh, Prof mentioned uh, may not have to be painful as well. So um, there are, uh, I think uh, the AU commissioner mentioned, uh, and which I indicated earlier again, the international financial architecture need to respond to this um, narrowing physical space in African countries at the time when where they were doing excellent job managing the economy from collapsing. So, so that is my parting point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, not to thank you, not to keep uh, anyone uh, in this room uh, here uh, any further. Uh, pr um, uh, Ambassador, I get your point. Uh, but you, uh, many people are tired and do need to rejuvenate. Uh, but just uh, perhaps if we can just get a closing remark from uh, Professor um, Tuli Ngube, the Minister of Finance over at Zimbabwe. Uh, so I'm not too sure how many hours of sleep that you had, and at the uh, risk <laughs> of being unpopular to you also, just to spare a minute or two more of your time, so just to let us know uh, what you'd like us to take away. I, I, I think really the AFDB should continue with the thought leadership drive to assist uh, us who are policymakers on the ground, assist us in making sure that we can support those critical growth drivers that will uh, you know, continue to build resilience, uh, that will enable us to build uh, the national shock absorbers, to be able to absorb all these shocks, whether it's price shocks or interest rate shocks. A, 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 to continue doing this, doing this steady work. A, 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 for, for us here, the, the issue really is, is climate change, and that is a, a, a shock that is we, 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 we need to respond to, and we have to invest in climate proofing uh, our agriculture, and I suspect uh, other countries in Southern Africa will be doing the same. I can think of a country like Mozambique, which will be affected by similar issues, uh, you know, uh, by Mozambique but also Malawi, which can be affected by similar climate air conditions. So this is a, a, a real. The other issue really that's urgent for us is one of a debt restructuring. Uh, so really any uh, you know, continental uh, driven uh, you know, um, uh, ideas about 
uh, you know, dealing with this issue rather than on a one-on-one uh, -on -one basis would be helpful. So that would be the comprehensive holistic approach on how Africa could be assisted in this debt uh, restructuring uh, drive. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, just uh, on my uh, parting shot, uh, a big congratulations, obviously, for uh, yourselves, uh, but Professor Rama, the entire uh, team that contributed to these insights. I think that uh, now the uh, work uh, does uh, stand with those who are at the uh, close proximity of uh, policymakers who can ensure that a lot of the change and the recommendations that this report advocates for uh, can be done and should be implemented. And what I can say is that us as members of the media, we also look forward to understanding further the insights of this report so we can continue to hold to account uh, those of you who you know, you know should be doing more. But with that said, thank you to everyone also for your participation. It's a close.